Hello everyone and welcome to the first of Bright Green's interviews with the leadership candidates in the 2021 Green Party leadership election. Before we go any further, um, I just have one thing to ask you to do, which is to scroll down below and hit that subscribe button. It means that you won't miss any of the interviews we have coming out with the other candidates or any of the other videos that we're putting out from Bright Green's channel. It doesn't cost you a penny, so scroll down below and hit that subscribe button right now. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our candidates that we have with us today. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to first be joined with by Adrian Ramsey. Adrian, how are you doing today? I'm good, Chris. Thank you very much. Yes, campaign's very busy. We're feeling positive and upbeat. And yeah, how are you doing? I am doing very well. It's a little early for me. I'm not normally up at this hour, but, um, <laughs> but hopefully I'll get through it. Um, of course, Adrian isn't standing alone in this election. He's standing on a, on a co-leadership ticket with Carla Denya. And I am, of course, also joined by Carla Denya. Carla, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Also not delighted to be up on a Saturday morning, but I'll live. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so for some of the questions, um, I will put them to one of the candidates, but for most of them, they're going to go to uh, both the candidates and it's up to Adrian or Carla to choose who responds or both of you respond. Um, and uh, hopefully this will be a productive conversation and we'll give uh, members an informed um, approach to this election and allow them to make a decision based on the candidates that are before them in this field. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to fire over my first question for you, which hopefully is a straightforward one. Uh, so why do you think that you are the best people to be leading the Green Party at this time? <laughs> sure. Well, perhaps I'll start on that and, and Carla can come in. Uh, this is such an exciting time for the party in a time when green politics has never been needed more. Uh, we're seeing growing warning signs about the climate emergency, both in the UK and around the world, growing awareness increasing inequality at home and abroad and at a time when we need to be clear that there is a different way forward where we can create a fairer more inclusive greener society whilst creating a green recovery from this awful pandemic and we feel this is the time with the party consistently polling third in the opinion polls across England with us having trebled our number of councillors across England and Wales we need to take green politics to the next level and we feel that requires a leadership team with a track record of winning elections, of taking the green message to the general public through experience as elected Greens. And we're the ticket that have got that experience. We're actually the only ticket that have got the experience as elected Greens, combined with the professional backgrounds that we bring um, and our knowledge of, of green issues and, and, and inclusion issues to support um, this, this party to move forward. Yeah, I also want to um, jump in just to big Adrian up a bit. Um, uh, newer members might not be aware of the massive contributions that Adrian has made to the party. Uh, when he was deputy leader, he uh, co-wrote the book on Target to Win, which is our electoral strategy and without which many of the party's current councillors, including me, probably wouldn't be where we are. So uh, he, I mean, he's, he was a professionalising force in the party, set up loads of the systems that we now use to get um, get Green councillors elected, including the, the the ground. He laid the groundwork that led to us having um, field organisers, for example. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the difference that Adrian can make alongside me uh, as leaders and on GPEX. Thank you. And, and one of the advantages of co-leaders is that you you can emphasise the other person's strengths. And uh, I, I'm sure lots of members know Carla's strengths, and there are lots of them. One of them, of course, is that Carla was the first councillor to propose a climate emergency declaration in the UK back in 2018, committing Bristol to be carbon neutral by 2030, which not only had a huge impact in Bristol, but hundreds of organisations, including three quarters of councils in England and Wales, the UK government, lots of private and public sector organisations have followed that lead. So you know that is real leadership. And at a time when we need to be setting the agenda, not just on those goals, but on the policies that need to follow through, I think someone with Carla's experience in the Green Party leadership is, is exactly what we need right now. And of course, she's our candidate in Bristol West, which is our best shot, our next Green MP. And so I think really well placed to be in the leadership team at this time. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to put to you was, um, so you're standing in this leadership election, um, you know, I mean, there's, there'll be a leadership election scheduled in the future. Um, the Green Party's process requires um, there to be regular elections every two years. Um, but I just wanted to focus on the kind of 
the term that you're standing for now um, and in that period what do you want to have achieved by the end of your first term um well there's a there's a lot of different things to focus on but i think uh our top priorities have to be to um uh work on the, the in inclusivity of the party um that's one of our clear priorities so there's a few different issues there um view some viewers might have seen our article in in pink news a few days ago um obviously uh trans rights uh is something that uh, has caused a lot of friction and upset in the party and, and incidences of transphobia that have been very distressing to see. Um, and we have a plan to tackle that, which is kind of got several different prongs. So uh, part of it is around uh, like learning and listening. And we really want to support uh, all of our liberation groups, actually, but LGBTIQA Greens in this instance to um, run training sessions led by them workshops uh, facilitated that will help uh get everyone up to speed because i think that sometimes um sometimes prejudice comes from just not knowing or from fear um and I, we've already seen this modeled really well by the jewish screens who um did a road show to local parties on anti-semitism which i attended one of their sessions of and i thought that they facilitated that in a really good way where there was a clear line um, about what anti-Semitism is and, and you know, why it's a problem, but it was also facilitated in a way where there was no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, and it was a really um, kind of safe feeling space to have those discussions. And so I would really love to see, and I'm very keen to support LGBTIQA Greens to do something similar on transphobia and perhaps our other liberation groups on other relevant issues. And I think that um, kind of open learning process will really help the party to, to move on. But we have to recognise that uh, sometimes learning and discussion won't fix everything. And so and we have to say that abuse and harassment are not acceptable in any context and that that's a red line. So that means um, making sure that our disciplinary process is fit for purpose. Uh, so at the moment, the, our disciplinary complaints process has huge delays, um, which means that cases don't get dealt with in a suitable time frame. And just there are some details about the procedures of the disciplinary process, which are um, not fair and open it up to abuse in some cases. So um, although as leaders, we can't single handedly fix those things as members of um, Green Party Executive Committee, GPEX, we will definitely be pushing to make improvements to how the party works um, for that and generally to be more efficient, more transparent, more fair for members. Was there anything you wanted to add, Adrian, in terms of other priorities? I realise I just... <laughs> <laughs> we, we, Carla has very eloquently outlined one of our key, key priorities in terms of uh, inclusion in the party and uh, on all liberation and... Um, equal rights issues, um, taking an approach where we encourage dialogue and understanding at a human level, which I think is, is just so important. So I don't need to add to Carla's <laughs> eloquent explanation there. Uh, in terms of one of our other key goals, we've said very clearly that we want to see Greens with power and influence in every corner of Wales and England. And we can do that through how we step up the proven strategies that we've put in place over the last 10 years. So we've already shown at local election level that through the right resourcing, through support for local parties, um, through training up campaign organizers and volunteers, uh, the, the field organizers network campaign school and so on, that we can continue to deliver big step changes in a number of councillors. And we need to continue that so we have many more councils where we have Greens elected and we have many more councils where Greens are in real positions of power, as is, is the case in 14 councils already. Um, I think we, we know how to step that up. That's about putting clear resources and consistent support into that strategy. And because we have that experience of successfully winning elections, consistently and of, of serving as councillors, taking the green message to the wider public, I think we're well placed to make that happen. And we want to roll that out across all levels of government. And I think when it comes to elections like the Senate, 
and gaining more green MPs in Westminster, both of which should be strategic priorities for the party. That's about having a clear long term targeting strategy that's well resourced and arguably the only general election where we've had a consistent, clear strategy over many years, over at least two elections, was in 2010. And I know from when I was in the leadership team previously and from the decade leading up to that, um, we had a very clear and consistent targeting strategy, first and foremost with Brighton Pavilion, that of course was successful in getting Caroline Lucas elected. And we need to emulate that, but we need to do so in a way that puts that resourcing support, clear messaging behind those winnable seats. First and foremost in Bristol West, and in that pipeline of seats that we know is there that can follow on. So in the short term, it's about putting those structures in place, um, setting an example uh, internally that we need to, to, to get behind those really clear, clear goals for the next phase of Green MPs. And I think it's also about setting the uh, basis for what we need to achieve during this decade, where I think we need to be taking um, taking a, a, a lesson and a, an inspiration from what's happened in Scotland in the last week, subject to the vote of Scottish Green members today, uh, where Greens are likely to be going into, into government, having a real influence on everything from a fair economy, human rights to climate and ecological action. And um, much as you can see tipping points in climate and scientific changes in society, I think you can see changes in, in, in politics as well uh, that reach tipping points. You know, politics through in the later parts of this decade are not going to look what, what it looks like today. So we need to put in place the, the structures and be ready to create and ride a green wave that may mask no other in terms of where our membership could get to and where our numbers of MPs could get to and the real influence that we can deliver. And I'd like to see, you know, we would like to see what's happening in Scotland emulated in other parts of the UK, and we need to be building the structures of the party in a way that can take us to the next level. Yeah, um, and just to add one other thing um, is about um, communicating the Green Party's message. So, um, Chris, you were specifically asking about the next um, two years of this term, but actually um, the most obvious immediately looming example of that is communicating around the COP26 climate conference. Um, which is a huge opportunity for us as Greens to get our message out there. I think um, media outlets are increasingly coming to us, um, you know, not just for a soundbite about something, but, you know, for, for more detailed policy. And so putting forward our, like, exemplary policy platform around COP26, um, I'm actually hoping to be there in person, if possible, uh, to... To, to really be that mouthpiece for the party. And so that's got to be a big part of our strategy for the next few months. So the two of you have mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to pick up and go into in more detail, which is really helpful. Um, so I'm going to park the, the question, the, the issue of um, uh, trans rights and, and that stuff for, for later on. But the thing I wanted to pick up first is, is, is what Adrian was talking about there around uh, electoral success. Um, and you actually finished your answer um, by talking about the kind of state of the climate, um, mm -hmm. which uh, increasingly is looking even more dire. Uh, mm -hmm. Every time we get an IPCC report, it gets worse and worse. Uh, we see that government after government um, fails to take the action that we desperately need on the climate. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, in the uh, in your on your platform, you're talking about in four years' time winning a second Green MP and 900 councillors. Now, there'll be some people who'll be watching this and thinking, as brilliant as Carla Denyer is, getting Carla into parliament alone isn't going to solve the climate crisis and we're running out of time. So mm. how would you respond to the criticism that would say two MPs and 900 councillors in four years time just isn't enough to match up to the scale of the crisis that we're facing? So um, I'm gonna get, let Adrian answer the bulk of this, but I just wanna say that the um, our platform is talking about at least a second MP. So we're not limiting ourselves to that at all. That's just saying that that is our bare minimum. <laughs> yeah, I, I, look, Chris, um, I, I completely share your analysis in terms of the urgency of the issues and the need for powerful green ideas to be at the centre of political debate. And we can make that happen through how we communicate in extremely clear ways what the green message is, how we can create a, a, a fairer, better future for all by implementing a Green New Deal and a universal basic income and, and get across our vision for society. And with the party polling third in the opinion polls, 
we've got every opportunity to be at the heart of that debate. Uh, and we are a political party. We want to achieve that influence by having more and more Greens in positions of elected power. And we know that Greens in the room, Greens in positions of influence, whether that's no overall control or running an administration, have such um, a bigger impact. And that, you know, with Greens in positions of power in governments in so many countries in Europe, in New Zealand and so on, we, we, we do need to be aiming to emulate that here. The question is, how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? And you know, any candidate can come along and just make promises about where we want to get to. Uh, I'm used to being a chief executive of a charity where you also need to think about how, what's the plan to get from where you are now to where you're aiming for. So I think you, you need to think about both ends of the spectrum. So to start with the starting point, you know, the, re the reality is that we've done very well in expanding our number of councillors in recent years. We've built on the infrastructure that was put in place 10 years ago and that people across the party have made a reality through um, local, strong, vibrant local campaigns across the country and the field organiser network and so on. We, we have the ability to scale that up. The 900 councillor target is what is in the adopted um, political strategy of the party. So we are saying we're the team that's best placed to make the party's existing aims happen because of our experience. But we don't see that as a ceiling. We see that as a trajectory we're already on that we would want to um, expand on a, and, and maximize. And if we're successful in increasing the party's resources, I do have experience of driving large scale fundraising and I want to work closely with the, with the fundraising team as Carla would to, to, to support our goals in that area. You know, this is a minimum aim that we're working on. We want to maximise influence. So we know how to do that at local government level. The harder question, of course, is MPs, because the, the, the truth is that since Caroline was elected and her majority has increased each time, people in Brighton and across the country like and admire what Caroline does. But the reality is we've had three general elections where we haven't won other seats. And we could all provide some analysis about the national political landscape and why we haven't done that. But I think a big part of the answer is that we haven't put in place a consistent decade long um, plan for where our target constituencies are well resourced and put those resources in and, and stuck to it consistently to break through. Campaigning for a few weeks before an election is never going to cut it on its own. So. Yes, the next starting point is how you win those next phase of, of MPs, including in Bristol West. And um, so our starting point is putting in place the structures to make sure that that happens and leading by example in saying we've all got to get behind this in the way the party got behind Brighton in 2010. Um, so, yes, we need to do that because otherwise, you know, we won't win the second MP and more. And that's that's the next step. And yes, you're right. That's not enough. You know, over, over this decade, we need the Green Party to maximise its influence so that we get on a real course to net zero and do so in a way that delivers a fair transition for vulnerable people at home and abroad and that um, delivers real compassion in politics at the same time. Only the Green Party's policies are going to do that. And so, you know, my feeling, as I said before, is that politics isn't linear. Um, you can see big changes in politics as you do in climate. We've got to be ready, though, to ride that wave when it comes along. And I think it is coming. We've seen just today that climate and ecological concerns are second amongst the list of, of um, issues that the British public are quoting as, as will influence their voting intentions and concerns for the future. That never would have happened in, in recent years. We know the reasons why the issues are so much further up the agenda, not least because we can see climate change happening around us and the effects that that's bringing. But we'll only be able to realise that if we have a really professional, well-organised party with strong governance structures set out behind us. And if we've got a clear long term electoral strategy um, and the, the sort of infrastructure and experience in the party that can that can realise that, you know, when the Lib Dems were at their peak and I, I'm very confident that's not going to happen again. You know, they did so partly because they had a you know that they, they sort of spotted a, a, a gap politically um, when they positioned themselves slightly to the left of, of New Labour for a period which wasn't hard, admittedly. Um, and that but that wasn't enough. They did it because they embedded in the party a real culture of winning elections and, and, and really strong targeting of parliamentary seats. And once as a party, we do for parliamentary seats what we've done for local seats. And we know how to run a thorough campaign across a whole constituency, both urban and rural. 
um, we can emulate that. So you've got to start from where we are. We've got to make sure we deliver the next few seats and then build the structures at what can become an exponential rate. We've already done it at local election level. If you look at that graph, but I'm not going to start by just saying, you know, we're going to get to the end of the graph straight away. We've got to start from where we are right now as well. So I think being realistic about what we can deliver in the next couple of years and making sure you do the next stages of that exponential curve goes hand in hand with saying we want real ambition for where we can get to during this decade and deliver that massive growth um, in green influence at a national level as well. So in terms of delivering that exponential growth that you described, um, and you've also touched on the, the changing nature of politics um, that's happening kind of all around us at the moment, um, in order to deliver that exponential growth at a parliamentary level, there's a need to build an electoral coalition of different groups of voters to deliver that. Um, different demographics, different uh, people in different economic positions, different mm. people in uh, with um, certain social views. What do you see as the electoral coalition that you'd be able to build that would be able to deliver that exponential growth um, in, in seats? We've seen from the Greens' recent success in uh, Bristol, which is obviously the case study I know the most about at the moment, that that's absolutely possible and is part of what helped us to do so well in Bristol. So we know that we were picking up votes from people that previously voted for Labour or for the Conservatives or for the Lib Dems or didn't vote. Um, and we didn't do that by pivoting to each of those groups and telling them each different things or, or misleading them about our policies. It's just about um, showing that we're hardworking, um, that we have a comprehensive offer, uh, that we, uh, are, we understand the problems that they face in their day-to-day -day lives, and we're not only talking about kind of abstract uh, or, or, or distant threats or solutions, but we're also talking about you know, improving their day-to-day -day life, their, their health, their happiness, their access to jobs and so on. Um, and yeah, I, I guess one of the things that Adrian and I bring with our experience as elected councillors is that when you're a local councillor, you have to talk to and work with people from all sections of society, mm. um, whether that's residents in your ward who you have to represent and help whether or not they voted for you, or um, business owners that might um, run businesses in your ward who <laughs> might be great, might be a bit challenging to work with. Um, and of course, politicians from other parties that you have to work with every day on, on um, committees and so on. And so we've got that experience of working with people from all sections of society, even where we don't entirely agree and um, doing our best to bring them along with us. So I guess, I guess what you've described there, I think, is 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 is, is clearly the case in local elections, mm. um, where you can bring people together with, I, I guess, di a divergent set of views um, around a candidate, a campaign that uh, kind of speaks to their local needs. Um, because on mm. local elections, the issues we all know them that people uh, care about and vote on are knowing who the candidate is, feeling that they're someone that lives in their area or that they'll represent their area. They also vote on things like bins and potholes and local public services, which are all incredibly important. Um, but when you're talking about national elections, when you're talking about how the country are run, is run, people are much more thinking about their interests as a whole in society. And I put it to you that it's perhaps more challenging to bring together those divergent interests in a national election when, for example, the interests of a landlord and the interests of private renters and council tenants are fundamentally different. And so how do you square that circle of trying to bring people together with those fundamentally different economic, social, cultural interests um, in a parliamentary election and a national campaign um, in a way that you've kind of tried to describe there for local elections? Yeah, that's a fair challenge. And it, yeah, you're right. It, it is uh, harder for national elections. Um, I'll, I'll start at the top of the answer by just saying that if, you know, if I'm choosing between appealing to tenants and appealing to landlords, it'll be tenants every time. Um, I'm an active member of the Acorn Community Union and I've done loads of work on renters' rights um, with both my Acorn and Green Councillor hats on. So that's that's a no brainer. Um, but yes, we, you, you do have to be careful about, you know, not trying to be all things to all people. 
um and i'm i'm you know very keen for for um us as a leadership team and the green party more widely to not be shy about our you know quite left-leaning policies um and promote those for what they are but to not promote them in a way that uh that alienates people who who didn't grow up in those traditions for example so um an example from from someone i know uh who uh had um never i don't think had ever voted labor and 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 says that they wouldn't ever but it's not because uh, and this was kind of before the green party got as big as they are now so they they'd kind of never voted left wing but it wasn't because they disagreed with left wing policies it was because they um were um very put off and a bit afraid of the kind of top-down centralized controlling nature of labor um and but actually when presented with um uh sort of policies that are on the left end of the spectrum from a more grassroots bottom up green party way they found that much more appealing so i i still think that 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 can be used when framing our messages um to talk to voters across the country um so i wanted to move on to a different part of elections and it's something that you've touched on which is wales um so adrian you described there the kind of situation that's going on in scotland right now where the scottish greens um have a growing number of msps uh, they are potentially by the time this goes out they they will be in the throes of discussing uh, the cooperation agreement with the snp if you're watching this later you, you've got the spoiler already. Uh, we, as we're discussing now, don't. Um, but one of the reasons that the, the Scottish Green Party has been able to build um, to the position where they're about to potentially have the first Green government ministers in the UK is because of the electoral system. Um, so in Scotland, you have a, a proportional system for electing uh, the, um, the Scottish Parliament and also for electing local councils. Now, in England, we don't get that other than uh, in the London Assembly, um, and we have a preferential system for some mayoral elections. Um, but in Wales, we do have a proportional system uh, mm. at, at the Senate elections and potentially in the future also in local elections. Um, so you've talked about wanting to get the first member of the Senate elected. How would you um, get there, get the Greens into a position where it takes Wales seriously yeah. and runs a fighting campaign in Wales to get that Senate seat, to get councillors elected in Wales. I think we still only have one councillor elected in Wales. Um, how do you get to a position where the Green Party of England and Wales is really the Green Party of England and Wales? Well, you, so I spent five years living in Wales when I was leading the Centre for Alternative Technology. And so I have some insights and uh, affinity with the question you're asking, Chris. We are the Green Party of Wales and England, or England and Wales, whichever way you put it, both nations matter. And we need to reflect that in our targeting strategy, our communications and where our resources go. So I, I think getting Greens elected into the Senate is a really important strategic goal for the party. We need to put the resources of, of, of the Wales and England wide party behind doing that. And that requires consistent support um, for uh, for Wales and for um, whatever we identify as our, our most promising areas within Wales it, for, for, for many years leading up to the next um, Senate elections. Um, so we've got to put that um, support, that long-term strategy in place in exactly the same way as we would do for um, target Westminster seats. I, I'm not convinced we've really done that before. We have done sort of six month year campaigns with some support, I believe, from the party across England and Wales, but I don't think we've done it in a really full on long term way. So I think that's got to be um, crucial. Um, the, the, um, the regional lists are, uh, have a smaller number of members in Wales than they do in Scotland. So the threshold to win is, is, is higher. And that's one of the reasons we, we haven't broken through in the way that we broke through early in Scotland. Having said that, we got fairly close this time in two regions. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we, we've got the time between now and the next Senate elections to build up that support and clearly getting councillors elected in the meantime and building up those target wards is, is one of the building blocks towards doing that. So supporting Wales has got to be a priority. Uh, and I also know, including from my time um, leading CAT, uh, charity based in Wales, um, that um, influencing the Welsh government, because it's 
quite a lot smaller and newer in its bureaucracy and more progressive and has well-being of future generations written into its governing documents the ability to influence that body is 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 in some ways easier than it is to influence uh Whitehall or Westminster so getting a small number of greens in there and you know with a small number of seats we could well be in an influential position Labour usually have a bit short of a majority um I think that's got to be a priority for all many all sorts of reasons and then if we've got two nations um in the UK plus a number of neighboring regions and other parts of Europe where um where the party's having a real impact, that's going to have a knock-on effect for our credibility at Westminster level as well. So, yeah, Wales has to be a priority for all sorts of reasons, and we've got to treat that in a long-term way, not just in the six months before the next Senate elections. Yeah, um, completely agree. And I just want to add that although the, the priority has to be the, the strategy uh, side, uh, as Adrian's saying, of course, as co-leaders, we will also be um, enthusiastically traveling around the country to support um, parties that are fighting key elections. And um, especially for me in Bristol, where um, it's only just over the bridge, um, I certainly intend to um, head over to Wales and, and help out whenever there's a, a target campaign that needs some extra volunteers. <laughs> I'm going to move on from elections a little bit, although there will, being the Green Party, we will talk about elections, I'm sure. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask some questions that weren't framed in the context of that. Um, and the first one I wanted to put to you is, where do you think the Green Party is going wrong strategically at the moment? Hmm. Hmm. I feel like we've sort of Im implied our answers to that in some of the previous things we've said. So. Um, uh, I think that probably one of the key ones is uh, not as much long term planning as we would like to see. Uh, so partly that's not the Green Party's fault. Obviously, uh, the last two general elections were both snap elections, so it's somewhat difficult to plan around that. Um, but uh, we still could have been doing more long term planning as a party um, to prepare for those. And the, the the flip side of that is that we think we now have at least a little while until the next one in which we can do that long-term planning yeah um, absolutely I, yeah so I, I mean i agree in terms of organizational strategy which we, we we've set out in terms of political positioning i mean we want to build on the successes that the party's had in recent years and we are on a really positive trajectory um in terms of where we're at in the polls and our growth in councillor numbers and so on I think that there is still an opportunity that we could make more of to really get across how um, the aftermath of the, the awful pandemic and everything that everyone's suffered under it um, gives us a, an opportunity for a major reset and rethinking of society and, and, and building a, a green recovery. Um, many of those opportunities have been missed. We've seen, you know, um, fellow cut short and um, we've, 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 uh, uh, there was an opportunity there to, to create the universal basic income or at least to, to, to trial that. Um, we need to continue to make the case for that because I think that, um, uh, that the political opportunity to communicate the case for a universal basic income is much stronger than it's ever been uh, before. And indeed for a green recovery um, that we know we're going to need different types of jobs in the future. Um, that will have become really a clear um, during the pandemic, as people um, question whether they can, they whether um, we need to be finding um, new um, sustainable forms of of employment that um, really tackle the climate emergency and, and tackle issues of inequality. And so, I think making the case that we need a green new deal and putting the investment into green industries of the future and into a just transition, whether that's for farming, warm homes, transport, or any other area of the economy. Uh, I, I think there's an opportunity to, to argue that even more strongly, um, as well as um, continuing to make the case for a more cautious approach on COVID itself. You know, we, we're still seeing concerns around the Delta variant, and I think the party's been right to say there needs to be you know, a, a more cautious approach to things like encouraging mask wearing in, in crowded public places um, and uh, and that the government, frankly, got it wrong early on in the pandemic in, in, in not making judgments clearly and quickly enough. So whilst we were all enjoying things opening up more now, I think being clear that a more cautious approach is 
is um, needed is something that will resonate with the public and um, can be combined with us making the case for a green recovery. So on, on that point of a green recovery, a green new deal, a just transition, um, lots of different concepts in there. Um, they're concepts which mean uh, different things to different people and different people saying them mean different things by them. So when Ursula von der Leyen in the European Union talks about a green deal, that's a very different thing to the Green New yeah. Deal report that Caroline Lucas was involved in in writing in 2007, 2008. Um, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talks about a green new deal in the US, that's different to what other people would be talking about. So I wondered if you could articulate what your vision for a green new deal is um, and imagine you're selling this concept to the public um, as a whole. Well, uh, <laughs> let's see if Adrian and I think the same thing. Um, <laughs> I think that um, a Green New Deal is about working within the economic system that we have now uh, to produce a, a, a rapid and inclusive transition to um, a more low carbon economy uh, in a way that um, benefits everyone. So in a way that creates jobs and doesn't just leave workers to find their way from their old job to their new one, but supports them with retraining um, uh, and schemes to help them do that. Uh, and as Adrian just said, it, it has to be across um, many different sectors of the economy, um, including uh, energy, building new infrastructure, and um, as Adrian said, um, farming and food production, which I think doesn't get talked about as much. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? <laughs> That's the main bit. Go on, Adrian. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I totally agree. I think the, the, what we've got to get across is that there are really practical policies behind this, and it's about enabling a transformational change to happen in the same way that post the Second World War, the government decided you know, we need to have good quality um, council homes that are going to enable people to have a good quality of life after the war. We want to create a publicly funded national health service to meet people's needs free at the point of delivery. And the government decided this is what we're going to do. And we're going to make it happen. Now it's about putting in place the structures that society needs to tackle the climate emergency and do so in a way that creates a fairer society at the same time. and means we have lasting, fulfilling, well-paid jobs for people up and down the country. And so the opportunity is to create that, that change in a way that creates a better society. So to take um, the area that I work in at the moment, I currently lead a, a renewable energy charity focused on um, green homes. And what we've seen in the last year is a botched half-hearted attempt to provide some incentives to people to get um, insulation or um, heat pumps installed. And it's been administered extremely badly. Uh, and even if that hadn't been the case, the level of incentive and, and the, the fact that it was sort of relying entirely on market mechanisms is, is, is nowhere near enough. What we need to do is to say, look, we've got to get all the housing stock in the country um, to a stage where we, it's consistent with our net zero goals, where we can be tackling fuel poverty. And that requires um, insulation. It requires renewable energy. Um, it requires um, thinking about the, the, the transit energy transition in local communities across the country. We've got to take a, a proper society wide planning approach to making this happen and enabling all people, regardless of their income, to benefit from this opportunity to create warm homes and all of the lasting jobs that are going to go alongside that throughout that supply chain. And you could say that whether you're talking about the transport transition, whether you're talking about the ways we want to create um, uh, a sustainable food system as, as Carla's talked about. So I think we can spell out what this means in any given sphere and all of the benefits that go alongside creating a net zero future um, are worth having on their own. And we can make the case in terms of the benefits it brings to people's lives and to local communities, as well as um, the, the taking action on the climate emergency. So you've both kind of uh, given some indication of uh, an answer to this next question, those responses. Um, mm. But I wanted to ask you uh, how you define your political ideology. <laughs> well, we have 
we have both started to answer that. I've been a member of the Green Party since I was 16 in the late 90s. So I've always seen myself as a Green and seen, seen Green as my as my ideology. Um, and, you know, uh, so I haven't I haven't sort of felt a need to expand beyond that in terms of labels. Um, having said that, um, you know, if you look at the range of issues that I've campaigned on as a as deputy leader and as a parliamentary candidate in the past, it clearly um, you know, gives you an indication of my broader politics. So yes, it includes um, real action on the climate emergency and policies like the Green New Deal that both create a fairer society and um, a, a low carbon economy at the same time. And I've also got a strong record of campaigning against privatisation of public services, working with trade unions on, on issues um, such as that. Um, that sort of in becoming increasingly important, I, I think, that we are clear on um, on, on the inclusion and justice sides of the green uh, of green principles, and we're centering compassion in our uh, platform here, and that means compassion in terms of how we interact with each other. Carla talked about that earlier in terms of our inclusion policies, um, compassion for everyone in society. So you know we want to be tackling the dreadful cuts that there have been to crucial services that people rely on and to universal credit. We want to have a universal basic income where which meets everyone's basic needs. And we need to have compassion for people around the world. We need to recognize that it's the poorest in the world that suffer from an economy where richer countries have been plundering the Earth's resources for an economy based on trying to grow GDP rather than thinking about what's best for, for human well-being around the world. Um, and our compassion extends to the natural world and to other species and um, care for animals is a big part of my values and of what's distinctive about green philosophy as well. So, you know, clearly um, my politics is on, is on the left. Um, and as Carla was describing earlier, um, green politics is, is a distinctive philosophy compared to the sort of traditional labor approach in the sense that we, we value grassroots decentralization and we challenge aspects of the current economic model that Labour doesn't challenge. We challenge um, unlimited economic growth. We think about justice very much in global terms as well as in national terms. We think about compassion for other species as well as for, for all human beings. So that's why, for me, being green is a distinctive philosophy. And I suppose because the Green Party's always been my home, I, I, green is the label I use. And Carla? I don't really have anything to add to that. Adrian <laughs> put it perfectly. I agree entirely. Perfect unison between co-leadership candidates there. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple more serious questions before I move on to what I promised you were the flippant ones. We'll finish on those. Um, so how would your leadership differ from uh, previous leaderships that we've had? Ooh, um, I haven't been asked that question before. Um, it's, it's funny because it's quite an obvious one. Uh, I think that we both have quite a, uh, a, a, as you'll have heard from our answers to other questions, quite a strategic, long term, um, a kind of detailed, focused approach to things. And so um, we'll be uh, using our position on Green Party executive to um, really sort of push the Green Party to being um, kind of really well organized and uh, yeah, kind of helping to, to lead that, but also recognizing that we're not, you know, we're not leaders um, kind of up on a pedestal on our own, but as part of the team of Green Party Executive. Um, Adrian, do you want to? No, I, I think that's right. I mean, I've, um, you know, the party's achieved huge steps forward under previous leaderships. Um, most obviously, you know, the green surge that we saw under Natalie Bennett's leadership um, under Sean and Jonathan, we've seen a taking forward of the, the, the strategy for um, advancing our local election gains and, and delivering on the structures we put in place in the past for um, massive increase in councillor numbers. Uh, and of course, um, you know, I worked with Caroline before when I was in the leadership team and, you know, um, we really stand by the achievements we made in, in that time in terms of growing the party's 
structures and, and membership and, and um, profile. So, you know, we're here to build on past successes, not to not to um, talk them down. Um, and I think that um, that um, professional focus that we bring, both from our track record in the party, and I would say the experience that I can now add to that, having led to national environmental charities, uh, I think that that can make a big difference to, to the step forward we want to take. And I think there's a real hunger in the party. If you look at the statements from some of the party executive candidates, from some of the engagement we've had from councillors and members across the country, I think there's a real hunger for the party to really take the next step up in terms of our uh, professionalization of how we work. Uh, and just to be clear, um, that is about building on the fact that we are proud to be a volunteer led party and making sure that our governance structures and the way the party executive works um, supports our staff to be able to deliver on the, on the, the day to day running of the of the, the party centrally um, and um, means that we've got sort of really strong communication messages and support and the structures to support our election campaigning locally you know from everything that from all the interactions i've had i think we've got a really professional staff team we need to be clear on where the staff roles are where the uh, where the elected roles are and um and make sure that our our governance structures um in in every respect enable us to really move forward so it's, it's about building on where we've been before but i think bringing the range of skills we, we bring uh, and also i think it's i think it's true to say we would be the first leadership team not based in London um, or London and, and broadly the southeast. Um, um, so I, I think that in terms of the perspective that brings of, of representing communities in other parts of the country, um, that I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, I agree with what Adrian said there. And in particular, you know, yes, you know, no leadership team is going to be the same. So we, we do bring these different things. But I guess part of the reason why I felt a bit thrown by the question is that I had I in my head I wasn't framing it as a kind of what in what way are we different from our from our predecessors because I see it very much as a building on rather than a sweeping away and starting again approach yeah okay so I said that I'd come back to this uh point around trans rights uh later on and, and now is that moment um so Obviously, most people watching this will be aware of the context in which this election is taking place. So we shouldn't be having a leadership election right now. It's out of the normal cycle. Um, it's been triggered by the fact that Jonathan Bartley stood down. Uh, but crucially, uh, Sean Berry, who was in a co-leadership with Jonathan Bartley, said that she wouldn't be standing in this by-election for leadership because she felt there was an inconsistency between the party's policies on trans rights and the appointment of certain spokespeople. Um, now, we have also been in a situation where um, the issue of uh, trans rights has begun to uh, dominate uh, conversations in the party and the issue of transphobia within the party has, um, become, uh, has got worse over time. Um, so the question I wanted to put to you is, uh, Sean Berry and Jonathan Bartley, when they stood for the leadership in 2018 and in 2020, were very clear on this issue. Uh, they had a mandate on this issue to tackle transphobia, um, but we're in a situation where the party still has a problem with it. So where, why do you think that you will succeed in dealing with this problem where Sean and Jonathan haven't been able to? Well, it's, you know, I think we have to be honest that um, while we've got ideas that we think and, and hope will help, um, they won't probably fix it overnight, but we're going to do our best. Um, our, our approach is um, to take a clear and consistent line in support of trans rights, and that means externally and internally, uh, and to acknowledge that the UK is, you know, in the grip of this bitter culture war, if you want to call it that or whatever, um, and that the Green Party is sadly not immune to that. Um, and I, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but um, some of the proposals that we've put forward about that, about creating spaces where people can learn and engage and supporting the party's liberation groups to, to, to lead on that, um, I think um, will help in uh, bringing everyone to um, more aligned understanding about trans rights um, and the fact that they're not at odds with women's rights. Um, uh, and yeah, it, I, I think 
it has to be that in in combination with improving our um, disciplinary process um, on the good fences make good neighbours kind of philosophy that we need to um, uh, sort of facilitate a, a healthy environment at the same time as making clear what the red lines are in the party. And what, what, what are those red lines? Um, that any kind of abuse and harassment um, in, any, in any context is not acceptable. Uh, and that, you know, applies when it's about transphobia just as much as when, if it's about um, sexism or anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or, or, or any kind of prejudice like that. Um, well, and I, I know that some people have asked what we would do about, you know, would we kick certain people out of the party? I think we need to be clear that that's not within the power of um, the leaders of the party. And I think that it's right that it isn't. I, I wouldn't want to be in a party that was so hierarchical that the uh, leaders of the party had um, the unilateral power to kick people out that they disagreed with. So um, even though that might be inconvenient, I'm, I'm much happier to be in a party where that's not the case. So um, for that reason, mine and Adrian's focus is, is on what we can do to set the tone, mm -hmm. um, set the tone of discussions and, uh, and look at what we can do strategically and structurally within the party to make it an inclusive um, place that, that uh, in, inclusive movement that is, uh, you know, not just not racist, but anti-racist, not just not transphobic, but anti-transphobic, for example. And ju just to add to that, in terms of the, the red lines, which I think you're right to ask about, Chris, uh, as Carla says, any form of discrimination is completely unacceptable, and we have to be, um, we have to be clear about that. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's important to recognise that no, I, I've heard some appalling examples of, of, of abuse, and that's not acceptable in, in any form. Um, at the same time, I, I believe that the number of people who, in the party who are transphobic is, is very small. I think there's a lot of people who um, don't, who, who feel like they don't fully understand or um, want to learn more about the issues and from people I've spoken to including trans people in the party I think there's a willingness to help um, have that engagement and understanding help people engage at the human level understand people's um, lived experience give a space as Carla was suggesting for people to ask questions that they may be embarrassed to ask because they're not sure what the, the right answer is and really help people understand that you know some of the changes people fear might be happening are, are, are actually not new at all you know we've had the equality act since 2010 uh, we've had the gender recognition act since do, uh, 2004 um you know the, the, the it's not the case that there's a sort of sudden big change it's a question of helping people understand what the issues are so what why am i saying that i'm saying that because my view and and certainly trans people in the party i've spoken to have said this as well and you know we, we we need to talk to trans people in deciding how we approach this they've said you know people people will make mistakes and people may may well make um genuine mistakes or may seek clarifications and we also need to take time to understand each other's um perspectives um the sorts of things that are unacceptable would uh, are things like deliberately misgendering someone you know, if, 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 if it's clearly deliberate, that's that's not acceptable. That is a form of discrimination. It's questioning someone's um, right to exist. And, and, and I, you know, I, I can only imagine what that's like for someone to be on the receiving end of that. It's clearly not acceptable. I think the number of people in the party who do that is tiny. And, and well, you know, that's my experience um, as, a, as a percentage of our membership, I mean. So we need to engage with people, help them understand um, the, uh, the the issues and, and what it feels like for people who are on the receiving end of of discrimination and help people understand each other's perspectives help understand the perspective of someone who who grew up with feminism in the 70s and 80s and you know what feminism and intersectional um inclusivity looks like now may feel quite different and i think if we're talking to to, to engaging with trans people about that, I think that will help encourage that understanding and dialogue. And I think understanding and dialogue is, is key whilst being clear that there are those red lines uh, and that abuse and harassment is never acceptable. 
So <clears throat> we're coming to the end of our time together and I promised that we'd move on to some less serious questions. So I have just a few and you can keep your answers incredibly brief. Most of these are very straightforward questions. Um, so my first one of these is what is your favourite and your least favourite Green Party policy? And I'm going to go to Carla on this one first. Oh, um, I, I'm very bad at picking favourites. Um, I'm going to go... You're going to struggle on this if you're bad at picking favourites because there's yeah. a lot of those. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to go with my... One of my least favourites um, is probably our policy on um, that we are against the fluoridation of drinking water. Um, and this is a motion that um, I worked with Rosie Sexton to try and change at a previous conference. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, reach it on the agenda due to lack of time. Um, I understand why we have that policy. I think it's been in our policy book for a long time. And that at the point that it um, entered our policy book, the, the science on the relative um, benefits and disbenefits of water fluoridation were perhaps a bit less clear than they are now. But since then, the research has been very clear. And I think that the scientific case for water fluoridation in terms of children's health is very clear. Um, and I do think that our policies um, are sometimes seen by those with a scientific background as the bit that lets us down. And so um, I would like to see policies like that updated. Um, favorite policy, I many, I mean, I really, um, I do agree with the majority of Green Party policies. What's my favorite? Um, I mean, I am a big fan of universal basic income. That's definitely in the top five. So let's go with that. <laughs> Great, and Adrian? Um, I, so favorite, um, there's, there's lots. I think what I'd pick out is something Carla referred to briefly earlier, which is the fact that we recognize that as part of a uh, transition to a zero carbon economy, we need to fundamentally rethink how we produce food and how we manage the land. It's not just about sort of techno solutions as much as I work in the field of renewable energy at the moment. So we, we need to think about carbon sequestration, we need to be encouraging restoration of peatlands as well as, as, as rewilding and tree planting in all senses. Um, and we do need to move towards more sustainable forms of farming, agroecology, we need to recognise there needs to be a, a big reduction in meat and dairy consumption in order to create both a more compassionate food system and a food system where um, we can be you, sort of, um, moving away from really intensive forms of, of using energy and land and water. Um, so I think that's that's one of my favourites, that we have a really holistic approach to looking at, at what a, what net zero needs to look like. Um, least favourite, I, I mean, I, I, I probably have a fairly technical answer. I think our policy on hydrogen should be clearer. Um, it, it, it's, it doesn't say much and is perhaps implies a, a bigger role for hydrogen than we might actually see in practice now, given the statements we've been putting out. And I think with the government's hydrogen strategy having come out and an over-reliance on blue hydrogen, which is actually just fossil fuels, um, we need to be seeing through the rhetoric and the vested interests that are promoting that and saying, well, yes, hydrogen has a role to play if it's genuinely green and we shouldn't assume it's going to be a panacea, especially for things like um, heating our homes with, where we need to use proven solutions that are already there like like heat pumps and heat networks so it's slightly technical answer on that i'm afraid but we do need to i think expand on our policy on that i love this question because it, it brings up totally random things i never <laughs> thought we'd be talking about water fluoridation and hydrogen energy in this interview but we have um i'll route through my my last few uh, non-serious questions so adrian what is your favorite biscuit oh uh i i like chocolate chip chocolate chip and carla uh, I think it's hobnob for me. Chocolate or otherwise? Um, unfortunately, as I'm vegan, the chocolate hobnobs uh, okay. are not vegan. If someone wants to bring out a dark chocolate <laughs> vegan hobnob, I'm sure I would absolutely love it. <laughs> so I believe you're both vegan. So the next question is, what is your favourite vegan pizza topping, Carla? Um, I'm going to be one of those annoying people that doesn't like picking favourites. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But I will say that on the on the pineapple debate, I'm very much on the pro pineapple side. Pro pineapple, you just lost half the electorate there. I know, <laughs> Adrian. Oh, these questions are always controversial. Uh, yes, I am a long term vegan, and um, I, I I do like a margarita to be honest. Um, although you know, if there's pepper and courgette and spinach on it, that's even better. Excellent. Um, and another question that will definitely divide the electorate: Are you a cat or a dog person, Adrian? A cat. Um, um, I, mean, I, I love dogs, but if you force me to choose, definitely cat. 
<laughs> and Carla? I'm, oh gosh, I'm really straddling the divide. Um, so... <laughs> you can't triangulate on cats and dogs. You've got to pick a side. <laughs> So I think I would naturally be a cat person. However, I have the misfortune of being allergic to cats. Uh. <laughs> um, and thus far in my life, I've never lived somewhere where it was possible to have a dog. Um, I imagine I would quite like dogs, but I've not yet had the opportunity in my life to find out. Sad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got two final uh, silly questions, uh, although less silly than those three. Um, what book has influenced your politics the most, Carla? Um, so I think when people ask this question, they expect the answer to be, um, you know, some some impressive philosopher or some political tone. For me, it was actually a reference book. Um, it was The Rough Guide to Climate Change, which I read in my su summer holiday in 2007, about halfway through uni. Um, and I kind of bought it on a whim in a bookshop while I was um, uh, on holiday in Dublin. And it really gave me an epiphany. It wasn't an overnight epiphany, but it kind of happened over the month or two of reading that book. And that was the summer that I decided, partway through my engineering degree, to um, dedicate the rest of my life to trying to tackle climate change. Uh, and yeah, it just um, looking back at it now, the, the impact it had on the direction of the rest of my life is, is bigger than any other, probably. And Adrian? Uh, so, yeah. I Thinking back to when I was first um, getting involved in politics in my mid to late teens, I, I can think of two texts that really had an impact and, and stuck with me. So Seeing Green by Jonathan Porritt and E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. Uh, and I think in both those cases, we might talk about the issues involved in a different way now, but I think the principles that uh, underpin them still hold true. And certainly they had a big impact on me at that point. And my final question for you is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Adrian first. Uh, well, I, I mean, the, my first answer is, is probably too obvious in, in, in saying Caroline Lucas because we worked closely together in the leadership team before and, and Caroline has inspired me um, before and, and since. Um, and, you know, and yet there's people you know, up and down the party who, who give their time as, as volunteers and uh, as, as leading councillors, um, having a really big impact at a local level who, who inspire me every day with, 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 with all that they do. Um, so yeah, sorry that example is a bit obvious, but there are lots of people in the party who inspire me. <laughs> and Carla? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a proud member of the Caroline Lucas fan club. I literally have the badge from the Young Greens made a few years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm as inspired, if not more inspired by um, many of our uh, Young Greens. So here in Bristol, um, one of my newly elected colleagues is Lily Fitzgibbon. Uh, who uh, has, uh, well, she's 19 now. Um, I think she slightly resented after being elected that every headline was Lily, comma, 18, comma, says. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Lily, for those who don't know, was um, uh, co-founder and organiser of the Bristol uh, Youth Climate Strikes, uh, including organising that massive one that Greta Thunberg came to, um, which I think was a day or two before um, one of her exams. Uh, Lily is a phenomenal human being. She's um, not only uh, one of the most organised and competent uh, 18, 19 year olds I know, she's one of the most organised and competent people I know, full stop. Um, and it's fascinating and, and, and really inspiring to work alongside her. Um, we, we, we job share the role of um, shadow cabinet members for climate and ecology on Bristol City Council. And it's so great to have her and the other young greens working alongside me. Brilliant. I'm sure Lily will be thrilled to hear it. So that is all we've got time for today. Um, before I have a few bit of admin things to do, I just wanted to say a massive, massive thank you to Carla and Adrian for joining us this morning. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Chris. So 
The other people I want to thank is all of you who are watching this video and have made it this far. Don't go away just yet because I have a few bits and pieces to tell you before you go. The first of them, I said at the beginning, I'm going to say it again now, scroll down right now and hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you a penny. It helps Bright Green massively, but crucially, it means that you won't miss our upcoming interviews with the rest of the leadership candidates. Um, so very, very soon, we will have an interview with Amelia Womack and Tamsin Omond on their campaign. We will also have an interview with Ashley Gunn stock that is now confirmed too we are hopefully going to have interviews with the other candidates as well the only way you'll find out is by hitting that subscribe button so do it right now now i find this conversation absolutely fascinating i've learned a huge amount about carl and adrian i'm sure you have too if there's things that you agree with if there's things that you disagree with scroll down right now and tell us in the comments what you thought um now, for those of you who are new to Bright Green, this leadership election has brought many new people to us, but for those of you who are new, uh, you'll prob you may, may be aware, you may not be aware, but we don't have the funding and the backing of billionaires and, um, and multi-million pound businesses. Uh, what we do have is the support of wonderful people like you. Uh, the only reason we're able to put out videos like this, all the articles on our website, our coverage of the Green Party of England and Wales, the Scottish Greens, the Greens in Northern Ireland, the Labour movement, social movements, and much, much more on the left is because of the kind support of you. So if you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation today. Whilst you're on the website, you will find loads of articles um, on the leadership election. We are running a month, a, a, a monthly, a weekly roundup of all the news and goings on in the election every Monday, as well as running comment pieces from people on the campaign and news pieces on what's going on. And crucially, if you are a member of the Green Party of England and Wales, make sure you vote. Voting will open very, very soon. Get those votes in and vote for your favourite candidate. Um, so that's it from me this morning or this afternoon or whenever this goes out today. Um, that's it from me. Um, thank you so, so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.